फोन कर थैंक यू वेरी मच बिस्मिल्लाहिर्रहमानिर्रहीम आई एम डॉक्टर हसीब हैदर जिया एंड आई रिप्रेजेंट शिफा इंटरनेशनल हॉस्पिटल कैन एवरीवन हियर मी प्लीज ओके सो थैंक यू पीएसएच फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी डॉक्टर हसीब कैन यू हियर अस Yes, I can. I can. Can you hear me, please? Okay. Yes, okay. So thank you, PSH. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, the subject assigned to me is uh, living donor liver transplant and where we are uh, today. Uh, so the scope of my discussion. Would Excuse be me, uh, Doctor Asif. Sorry for interruption. Please, a uh, little bit. Uh, you can keep a mic uh, close to you so that we can hear you. Hear you clear. Uh, 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 clean. Is it better? Is, is it better? Yeah, it's okay now. Okay. So I'm going to speak about uh, uh, the world and the uh, Pakistan's perspective a little bit about uh, some of the uh, donor safety issues and how we can expand. Uh, the donor pool, and uh, then we have our favorite topic is HCC as always. Uh, ACLF and ALF, I will leave uh, for Dr. Saleh. He's uh, probably uh, coming in next, and then COVID-19. Uh, so let's uh, uh, let's look at what's happening in the Western world. So there is growing evidence uh, that uh, LDLT is equal, if not superior, to DDLT, and uh, there is a ever widening. Uh, supply demand gap and uh, uh, i think uh, between 20 to 25% weight weightless mortality has been seen over the past decade uh, so if you look at uh, the statistics of the united states and uh, the european countries you will find the total number of living donors um, were about 4.5% of the total uh, transplants done in the us 15 or uh, something in canada french and uh, germans they have been doing very little living donor liver transplant but this data is a bit old 2014 15 i think so there are uh, advantages of uh, uh, performing living donor liver transplant technical advantages i think just short cold ischemia time you will uh, get the chance to optimize these patients pretty well and then of course you expand the eligibility criteria so uh, uh, it is the real answer uh, in the western world to the organ shortage so if you look at the data in 2019 uh, uh, there were 12000 uh, patients active on uh, patients on the wait list and only 8372 got their transplant so one third actually waited uh, for more than a year so so this is huge about one third of the patients can't get a transplant in time and you know how these chronic liver disease patients when they wait what happens to them so in the western world i think it's the donor uh, issues the donor risk the uh, the real risks and the attributed risk i think they are the main uh, problem and obviously the rest of the technical challenge of ldlt so uh, so the pittsburgh group they recently compared the outcomes of uh, about 245 Uh, living donors with uh, the ddlt this is between 2009 and 19 and they actually um, uh, found there is a 3 year survival advantage uh, with ldlts uh, 86 versus 80% and primarily uh, this happens when you uh, reduce the weight less mortality similarly uh, the university of toronto also uh, looked at um, a lot of data and they they also reported a survival benefit and again Uh, i think that was uh, the there was short waiting at times and less drop out when you apply uh, ldlt into the uh, scheme of things so these two studies actually they are pretty uh, recent and they they also concluded that it's the experience of the transplant center the transplant surgical team and obviously of the hospital which is of paramount importance uh, so this is about western world Uh, in asia about 90% of the transplants are live donor uh, pakistan we are exclusively and absolutely living donor country about 2200 transplants have been done in the last 10 odd years so this is the bigger sort of canvas uh, where we look at pakistan uh, there are about 14 15 transplant centers uh, some of them perform sort of uh, occasionally and uh, the 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 ones 
uh, Shepa International, as you can see, about a thousand transplants. Uh, a very great institute is Gumbert, which is coming up really nice, 500, almost 500 transplants by now. And then PKLI, uh, again, a public service hospital is, is uh, uh, really picking up 10 to 15 transplants a month uh, now that Dr. Fessel has gone there. Uh, so this is uh, the bigger sort of uh, pic picture of uh, Pakistan. Uh, so what are the current donor issues? Um, obviously, the biggest uh, problem with uh, selecting a donor, every unit has their own criteria to select donors. It's more or, more or less standardized now. Uh, I think the biggest fear is a donor mortality. And uh, we've been quoting this figure of 0.5% uh, for right lobe donation. And I think this is the greatest uh, fear of uh, uh, a new program. And uh, obviously in the United States, there have been, uh, and rest of the world, there have been bad experiences about this. So this is what uh, sort of uh, is the main thing. And of course, the morbidity also needs to be kept in check. Uh, so generally the quoted morbidity for the live donors is as high as uh, 25%. So whenever we are selecting these donors, uh, we have uh, we basically look at three main things, uh, the age, the FLR, and the degree of steatosis. So uh, the, officially, uh, the official age for a live donor is 55. <clears throat> uh, but I think in the real life, we seldom see this age. And we are very aware um, of the challenges and the problems of patients or donors more than uh, 45 years of age. So we, we try to uh, stick below 40 as much as possible and hardly I, I can recall I think just one donor in the last 10 years where we went uh, more than 50 years of age. So again uh, the future liver remnant uh, the, the cutoff point is 30 percent. Uh, I think the, uh, the size of the FLR obviously uh, the CT volumetry can over and underestimate it sometimes. I think the more important thing is a well-functioning FLR uh, rather than a 30% FLR. Obviously, it has to be 30 or more. Uh, so this has also uh, become pretty relevant uh, when you're talking of FLR. Uh, so degree of steatosis, again, uh, the figure is 30%. Uh, I think this figure is, is a bit historic, and it is coming from the DDLT uh, times and the DDLT setups. Uh, we hardly accept any donor uh, who's nearing 30% of fat content in the liver. Um, we usually don't cross 15% and we have our own uh, protocol as most of the units in the world. And uh, we look at the LAIs and uh, uh, we don't go in the negative or the minus side of LAI. Uh, we simply reject donors who have uh, LAIs less than zero and between zero and five also we are pretty cautious. Um, obviously, we put them through program weight reduction and then reassess the LAIs. And once they are in a good range, uh, if time permits, then we take their donation. So thankfully, uh, we have had no donor mortality in the last 1,000 transplants. Uh, our morbidity is also between 10 and 15%. Uh, but uh, I, I would rather call this morbidity sequelae of surgery. And the major complications in the donors are actually less than 5%. So, so this is uh, uh, generally, this is all standardized now. Uh, the high volume units uh, have clear cut guidelines uh, to take these donors. So how do we uh, expand a donor pool? Uh, okay, so this is <clears throat> expansion of donor pools is also again from deceased uh, donor side. However, I think in LDLT also more and more uh, because the centers push for more transplants so as you need more transplants, obviously you need more donors. So, so we are looking at things and uh, at how to uh, enhance this pool. So one of the strategies is uh, to have a donor exchange program. I'm just going to touch upon it. It's not a very, very important thing, but it is mainly done to cope up with ABO incompatibility and to avoid the complications of ABO incompatibility. And I think most of the centers uh, usually, if they put patients through this exchange program, they would um, have ABO incompatibility in up to 15% of the cases. Then some of the centers would uh, sort of exchange the donors uh, if there is inadequate hepatic mass, that is again up to 15%. And then very less LDLT centers would uh, swap donors for uh, vascular or biliary anomalies. Most of them are uh, sort of uh, doable. 
so that is uh, one of the options in which you exchange donors. So Asan Medical Center, it's like our Mecca. Uh, they have done the, between uh, 2003 and 2011, about 26 paired exchanges. Uh, 22 of them were ABO incompatible. Four of them were for small, small graft through the recipient. So they obviously had uh, excellent survival, more than 90%. It's essentially a standard transplant. However, the emotional connection between the donor and the recipient is uh, sort of broken. And uh, so there are ethical issues in, uh, it's essentially an unrelated transplant. Uh, transplant. So that is uh, where we are on uh, uh, swap and uh, donor exchange. So another way to go ahead and uh, do transplant is ABO incompatible living donor liver transplant. So this used to have uh, really bad results in the past, I think uh, uh, 2005, 2010, uh, up to 2010, they were not having excellent results and there was uh, a lot of graft losses and obviously mortalities. And the results have really come up after the use of uh, rotuximab. So uh, there are varying protocols of uh, rotuximab, IVIG use and uh, plasmapheresis, sessions of plasmapheresis and all these patients get uh, sort of extra immunosuppression, actually more than extra sometimes. So the largest series, but gradually after rituximab, the results have really uh, become acceptable. And the largest series again comes from Masan Medical Center. Uh, I think up till 2012, they were doing about 13% of the total number of LDLTs were ABO incompatible. And now uh, as per one of the latest uh, papers I looked, they about uh, one quarter of their transplants are uh, ABO incompatible. And they have been able to demonstrate a very good graft survival as high as 95, 96%. So uh, the, the main problems with ABO incompatible used to be a severe form, a severe antibody mediated rejection. And also the diffuse intrahepatic biliary stricturing, which was as high as 8.5%. But uh, uh, so, so th that remains the issue. However, by after the use of rituximab, the incidence has really gone down. So one of our colleagues uh, at Gambat, he performed one of the ABO incompatible transplant that was widely publicized. So it's just one case in the whole of the country. And uh, obviously we are going to check with him what happened and how the patient has progressed. So what are the pros and cons? Uh, I think uh, ABO incompatible uh, is, is an area which needs to be explored. And I think uh, there, is a, there is a potential of increasing the number of transplants. Uh, obviously, as a private hospital, I think it will incur a lot of cost to these patients. And I'm looking and talking of maybe 1.5 to 2 million rupees extra. So I think uh, the lead has to come from the public uh, service hospitals this time in regards to the ABO incompatible uh, LDLTs. Okay, coming to uh, dual graft transplants. Uh, so uh, all of us know that we need a certain amount of the liver uh, for the metabolic needs of the recipient. And uh, uh, people have tried dual grafts uh, as I think they started back in 2001 and 2005. And um, up to one third of the donor are rejected due to obviously steatosis and low FLR. But I think the main reason for going towards a dual transplant or a dual graft transplant is the low GRWR. So you're looking at a heavy set patient and the potential donor is a, uh, is a thin slim uh, person with the inadequate liver mass on the right side. So this is a very complex um, and, uh, and um, undertaking and uh, sometimes it's very ironic because sometimes in your office a recipient comes with five donors and sometimes a single recipient is uh, struggling for a, uh, uh, even one donor. So, so the answer I think uh, uh, lies in not pushing towards dual grafts uh, uh, but actually there is a reasonable data that if you uh, reduce the GRWR uh, if you if you are getting a donor with low GRWR, you can actually achieve uh, favorable outcomes. So if you look at this uh, paper, this I think came out in 2017. This is from India, Kerala, and uh, they looked at uh, uh, two subset of patients, I think 48 patients in the low GRWR group and um, about 150 patients in the other, uh, the, the regular, uh, regular size graph. 
And what they were able to find uh, was that actually there was no difference. Um, there was no difference in complications, no difference in uh, hospital or ICU stay. However, uh, uh, what they concluded in this study was that um, it's not only the low GRWR, but it's the outflow uh, of the liver graft, um, uh, which is very important. When, whenever you go less than 0.8, uh, each and every vein, actually we used to reconstruct any vein on the outflow well, which was more than five millimeter, but they have gone in this paper, they have uh, uh, they've gone down to two millimeter wings. So a well-functioning low GRWR graft is equally good as per this paper. And, and we can also uh, vouch for that. We've done, uh, I think a couple of, uh, maybe at least uh, 25, 30 low GRWRs and, and they really they do really well. So, this is one of the papers. Again, there is a Chinese consortium who looked at, I think, as high as 4,000 patients and again, uh, divided them into uh, two set of uh, uh, checked retrospectively. I think they studied 18 papers and uh, they came out with this analysis. So they also were able to find out that five-year survival was uh, pretty equal and it was in the range. Uh, however, with the low GRWR graphs, you get a bit of... Uh, small precise syndrome and uh, you have to really medically manage it and also uh, i think in one of these two papers they were uh, it was not the grwr uh, which caused all the mortalities but it was uh, the sepsis which is uh, obviously the biggest killer we all know it is the sepsis which um, is you know so a combination of sepsis low grwr and a blocked new middle hepatic vein or the inferior sector outflow. This combination is lethal when it comes to low GRWR. So each and everything has to be meticulous. The outflow, uh, obviously the antibiotic prophylaxis and uh, uh, the rest of the things. So uh, that was about donors. I think these are a few of the things which uh, needed deliberation about donors. Uh, let's come to uh, the recipient issues. Okay, living donor liver transplant is synonymous with extended criteria, selection criteria for HCC. HCC is uh, the, the most burning issue. The gold standard is Milan criteria, as we all know, and we all also know that it's pretty restricted. Uh, I think um, in one of the studies in Japan, I think only 6% uh, of the HCC patient uh, uh, could be fit, fitted in Milan's criteria. And then we have another thing, uh, which is the BCLC treatment algorithm. Again, most widely used in the Western world and most some of the LDLT centers also, uh, I think in the initial periods were looking at BCLC all the time. So as my colleagues in the last couple of lectures also uh, sort of uh, discussed this issue. So what are the advantages of LDLT for HCC? I think it's, a, it's like a personal gift of the donor to the recipient. And as long as you can maintain uh, uh, a recurrence rate of less than 50% and you have acceptable outcome, you have reasonable outcomes in the recipients, um, this personal gift is, uh, is kind of acceptable in the LDLT setting. Uh, on the technical side, again, it's a good quality graph, short uh, cold ischemia time, and you can optimize and time these patients really well. So there are so many new criteria. Um, uh, all of them pretty much have come from the Asian uh, centers and the Asian countries. And they're not looking at the morphology, the size and the number, but they're looking at these markers and the tumor biology, et cetera. And then we also uh, just heard something about downstaging. So so, so let, let's look at this slide. So we have Milan and UCSF only looking at uh, the morphology of the tumors and modified Milan. Then we come down to Toronto and they're looking at the pathology, the biopsies. And uh, if you look at Kyoto and Kyushu universities, they have incorporated PIVCA2 or DCP in their protocols. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the overall survival is um, anywhere more than 70% uh, at four or five years, and which is, which is kind of uh, very good. So, so I think a lot has been done in, by the LDLT groups and they have all published huge data. And we, we're going to also show you some of the things we've done. So, uh, so again, if you look at, uh, uh, I think 
uh, Toronto and the rest of the Kyoto and uh, Asan Medical Center, uh, and even Hangzhou criteria, which is the most liberal. I think it's a modified Toronto and Hangzhou criteria, which um, are the more li most most liberal criteria, and all of them have reported uh, uh, survival of more than 70, 75 percent. So uh, this was uh, sort of extended criteria for HCC. Another burning topic is uh, the portal vein tumor thrombus. Uh, so uh, as an estimate, I think 15 to 30 percent of the patients of uh, larger HCCs have portal vein tumor thrombus of some sort. And uh, so this is one of the Korean studies which was published in 2017. I think uh, Dr. Fassel also looked at it. Uh, and showed it in the presentation. So they had 242 patients and uh, the controls were 184 and they have portal vein tumor thrombus patients who were 34. And uh, they were able to demonstrate uh, that reasonable results uh, of uh, survival uh, came in the segmental portal vein tumor group as high as 63.9 and 50%. And what they, the interesting uh, uh, feature of this study was that the microvascular invasion, which you cannot identify preoperatively, I think you find it once you have sent the specimen out, uh, uh, the segmental portal vein tumor thrombus and the microvascular invasion, they had similar uh, uh, disease-free uh, survival and overall survival. So this, this, is, uh, this is an interesting part in this study. And then the tumor marker, alpha fetoprotein, you know, in the segmental and the microvascular and the control group, if the AFP was less than 100, you would achieve as good results as uh, for what you achieve in Milan's criteria or PCLC early stage zero and A. So what they concluded was do not transplant in the low bar uh, portal vein tumor thrombus because the results are uh, really dismal. So again, this is one of our articles we published in 2021. I think again, uh, these are the interesting articles and what, what we were able to do that we had 27 patients with portal vein tumor thrombus, uh, we downstaged them. So this is about downstaging. 15 of them were downstaged and uh, I think the 12 patients were not, not downstaged. What we found that you had poor responders and good responders. So the ones who responded good results more than 80%, obviously, and alpha fetoprotein has to be kept in mind. The poor responders, if you look at the poor responders, out of the 10 patients, only two were alive at the time we were writing this study. So if AFP is more than 10, and uh, if you don't downstage well, um, uh, the, the chances are really bleak. Again, uh, the ones we didn't uh, downstage, VP1 and VP2 tumors, uh, the segmental and the subsegmental branches. And if your AFP was less than 100, again, three out of three were alive uh, at the time. And if you go into the low bar branch of the portal vein, and if your AFP is more than 100, uh, you can see it is one out of nine. That is a sort of a dismal uh, prognosis. So again, the Kaplan-Meier curve for the low risk group, more than 80% at five years, and uh, you see the slope for the others. So this was also uh, one of the burning issues at the current uh, stage of LDLT where we are. So we have a very robust MDT and we have seen over thousands, I think thousands of, of thousands of patients in the last uh, 10, 12 years. And I think the role of MDT in selecting these very complex patients, because you have to take, uh, take into consideration a lot of things and you, you need a holistic approach because for the same uh, tumor, uh, for the same patient at one point, at, at one, when, and one end you're offering uh, liver resection or liver transplant. And on the other side is just supportive care. So you really need to fine tune the management plan for these patients. And this comes with the collective wisdom of uh, the radiologist, the surgeons, the oncologist, and obviously our hepatologist. Um, so anyway, this is an interesting slide which will come. I think we uh, uh, looked at, uh, so if you come to the BCLC staging system, uh, the very early stage and the stage A tumors are only offered uh, liver transplantation and uh, sort of curative treatments. And they just constitute 10% of HCC patients. So what we did, we looked at, retrospectively looked at- uh, Dr. Seep, sorry for interruption. We are running short of time. Can you please briefly summarize, please? 
So we, we looked at these patients and what we were able to find uh, in this paper that uh, if we compared the treatment option for uh, the either group, we were able to offer curative treatments to about 13% patient, more patients. So this is what we sort of found out and the curative treatment. So this is LDLT. They push these boundaries and take the numbers higher. So last, I'm going to rush towards COVID-19. So COVID-19 hit us like a storm, like everywhere else. And uh, it was, I think, 15th March when we had to stop our program and the numbers drastically dropped. Uh, we also put in these uh, uh, parameters for selecting the donors and recipients. And we also published our data. This is my last slide. So we worked up 66 pairs for transplantation in the COVID era. I think it's about nine or 10 months long study, uh, the, the numbers. And we had a waiting list death of about 13 patients. And uh, they were surprisingly, nine patients died because of liver related decompensations and two were from COVID related uh, issues. So if you wait long enough on your waiting list due to COVID or anything else, you, uh, your chances get bleaker. Anyhow, we eventually transplanted 53 patients and uh, uh, seven had obviously preoperatively had COVID-19 and eventually once it was resolved, we transplanted them and in that group, we had one death. And amongst the donors, we had three donors who had COVID-19 positivity before donation and once they became negative, we uh, took donations from them and they all recovered nicely. So also uh, the, the general uh, our results were similar for both the MEL scores less than 20 or more than 20 in this era. So that is pretty much all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asi Bedarzia. Uh, now we are uh, lucky enough to have Dr. Abdul Wab Dogar for the next talk on the liver transplantation in Pakistan, the way forward. He is a, a program director, head of department, liver transplant, epitobiliary pancreatic unit at Gumbert Institute of Medical Sciences. Dr. Abdul Wab Dogar, please. Thank you very much, uh, PSH and the honorable guests. Uh, I am here to present uh, the way forward of living donor liver transplantation in Pakistan. So first of all, uh, before start uh, of the discussion, I would like to mention that whatever I will discuss here, this is uh, uh, what we have done uh, in Gumbert. And this is the same model which uh, I will present to be replicated and to be adopted in the rest of the country. Uh, I will particularly mention Dr. Najmal Hassan here and also the chairpersons, Dr. Amir Latif, Faisal Hanif, and Dr. Muhammad Saleh. So let's start the discussion. Sure. 